Hello. I just want to add my welcome to the welcome that Audrey gave and also to say hi to the people online as well. I just wanted to leave this phrase up here because this is basically the talk this morning. I will rest in your promises and especially this next bit, your confidence, my confidence is your faithfulness. So in other words, we're co not confident in anything that we do, we're confident in who God is. So I could just sit down now, but I'm not going to because I've prepared a talk um, around this whole area of what a covenant relationship looks like that we find in the books of uh, Romans, and actually we find it all over the Bible. The answer to the world's problem, the world's problems, begins and ends in God's covenant faithfulness. It begins and ends in his righteousness. It's completely and utterly dependent on him, not on us, which you'll be glad to know. So what is a covenant? Well, here's a definition that I've taken from the Bible project. A covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. They're often accompanied by oaths, signs, and ceremonies. Covenants define obligations and commitments, but they are different from a contract because they are relational and they are personal. Think of a marriage. A husband and wife choose to enter into a formal relationship, binding themselves to one another in lifelong faithfulness and devotion. They then work as partners to reach a common goal, like building a life or raising children together. In the book of Romans, which we're looking at uh, together over the next five weeks, Paul sets out this covenant relationship. This is chapter four. We have been seeing that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, it was before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised or before the covenant was initiated. God's covenant promise was on his initiation. It was not dependent on Abraham in any way. When God approached Abraham, he wasn't a good Jew following all the Jewish laws and customs. This all happened before the nation of Israel. God credited Abraham as righteous before he even received circumcision as a sign of God's promise. God's covenant with Abraham was unconditional. By unconditional, I mean that Abraham didn't have to do anything to enter into this covenant relationship. The initiation was God's. The offer of a covenant relationship was unconditional. Often covenant relationships are conditional, but not this one. I think this is an important point to grasp because I think we can often get this wrong or a bit confused in our Protestant, independent, evangelical world. Often we've allowed a culture of must try harder, must be better, when the whole point of this covenant relationship is it's not about what we do, but it's about who God 
is. It's not about the achievement of goals or activities. It's unconditional. It's about the offer of a relationship, a covenant relationship by God to us. I need to be honest with you this morning and confess that I find this really, really difficult. I find it really difficult that this offer can be made to me without me doing anything for it. It's kind of human nature, right? The concept of reciprocity, I knew I was going to get this wrong, reciprocity, dang it, I even practiced that this morning, (laughs) is kind of hardwired into us. For example, the parents out there that do football lifts or any other kind of lifts to any kind of activities, every time a kid gets, one of your kids gets a lift, it's kind of natural to want to reciprocate it. There you go, I changed the word so I could see it. How quickly can I return this favor? I'm also a highly competitive person. To be honest, highly competitive is a bit of an understatement. Sometimes when I watch my younger two kids playing sport or games of any kinds, I'm like, this is completely my fault. This is me. So for me, standing here before you this morning, a meritocracy, a way of us earning our relationship with God is much more palatable. But there's a massive problem with this way of thinking. It's just plain wrong. God's offer to us is not conditional. It is not a meritocracy. It is unconditional. God comes to us and offers us a relationship with him with no strings attached. He accepts us. He accepts you just as you are. He loves you just as you are. There is not one person around you right now that God loves less than you. There is not one person around you right now that God loves more than you. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God offers you a covenant relationship with Him today, now. Paul says in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And there might be somebody here this morning that is hearing that for the first time and wants to get started in a relationship with him. So let's do that this morning. You can come up at the end and we can pray with you. There might be people in here this morning that just need to hear that it doesn't matter what you've done over the last months, that God just loves you just the way that you are. You see, I have got bothered, really bothered, about the increased polarization within our culture. It is increasingly difficult to cross the divide and look for compromise, common ground, and the ability to work together. And this polarization has affected the church as well, particularly in Protestant evangelicalism, which is the strand that we come from. When we seem to find new things to fall out about and disagree about in every generation, This is a them and us culture that has developed both within and out with our churches. We've got used to defining ourselves by what we're not. My number one frustration is the concept of mature Christians versus immature Christians. Not that there isn't Christians that are starting off in their faith journey and those that are a bit more seasoned, It's just the whole idea that we would categorize people and put ourselves in the we're better than you or we're more than you camp is just ugh. It's just ugh. Them not together people versus us together people. 
them in the community versus us in the church. This is so ironic. It's ironic because the whole point of the covenant relationship is that it is unconditional. Abraham did absolutely nothing to deserve this covenant offer from God. This covenant that God offers is for everybody. This is not a meritocracy. Our culture is a meritocracy, or at least it pertains to be. God's covenant is not. It's the complete opposite. Today, everybody is welcome. Period. No ifs, no buts. Everyone is on an equal footing. God makes the offer to everyone. Why is it so important to understand covenant relationships, particularly as it relates to Scripture? Well, here is Brett Berger from Grand Canyon University in Phoenix in Arizona. It is because the covenants provide the skeletal framework for how the whole biblical story holds together. As the story of the Bible unfolds, we see God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, and covenant-fulfilling God. God establishes covenants with certain people, and these covenants are the way God unfolds his redemptive plan. The covenants are the structure of the whole story. Now, there are five main covenants that are crucial for understanding the story of the Bible and God's redemptive plan. And I don't really have time to go into them all today, otherwise I'd be here all week. You could probably do a learning stream in each of them. But I just want to mention them this morning because I think it's important for us to understand the covenants that, made, that God made with different people within the Bible. The first one is the one that he made with Noah, and you can find this in Genesis 9. This is a covenant God established with Noah after the flood, in which he resets and renews the blessings of creation, reaffirms God's image in humanity, and the work of our dominion over the earth. This covenant promises the preservation of humanity and provides for the restraint of human evil and violence. The second one, which we've mentioned and we'll look in a bit more detail, is the covenant with Abraham. And that's the one that Paul is using in the book of Romans. And you can see that in Genesis 12 and 15 if you want to read into it. This is the one that is the most central to the biblical story in it, God promises Abraham a land, descendants, and blessing. This blessing promised to Abraham would extend through him to all the peoples of the earth. So that's Noah and Abraham. And the third one is the covenant with Moses. And this is Exodus 19 and 24. This is the covenant God establishes with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai after he had led them out of Egyptian slavery. With it, God supplies the law that is meant to govern and shape the people of Israel in the promised land. This law was not a means of salvation, but would distinguish the people from the surrounding nations as a special kingdom of priests. And we've talked a lot about that way back in the home series. This covenant was conditional and defined the blessings and curses based on obedience or disobedience. The fourth one, the covenant with David, 2 Samuel 7. This is the covenant where God promises a descendant of David to reign on the throne over the people of God. It is a continuation of the earlier covenants in that it promises a king as a figure whom God would secure the promises of land, descendants, and blessing. This covenant becomes the basis for hope of a Messiah and make sense of the Gospels concerned to show Jesus was the rightful king of the Jews. All of them were formed in what we term, or scholars term, the Old Covenant. And the last one is the New Covenant, which is mentioned first in Jeremiah 31, 
and also you can find it in Luke 22. This is language that is used. It's language of the promise of rescue and renewal of the exiled people of God in Babylon. It promises a coming day when a God would make a new covenant, which is what we find in Jesus. It's unlike the original one that Israel had broken. This coming day would bring forgiveness of sin, internal renewal of the heart, and intimate knowledge of God. On the night of Jesus' last supper, Jesus takes the cup and declares that his death would be the inauguration of this new covenant. And just in a little while, we will celebrate that together as Audrey leads us in communion. Okay, so if this covenant is all about God's initiation and it's God's free offer, what is required of us? What do we bring to the party? What do we bring to the table, so to speak? Well, this is Romans 4, where Paul is talking about Abraham. Verse 20. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So, Abraham didn't waver. God strengthened him in his faith, and he gave glory to God. So, our job is to not waver in our faith, right? Well, yes, God will credit righteousness to those who have faith in God who raised Jesus from the dead. All Scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. However, sometimes we don't even have faith. Let's be honest, sometimes our faith falters. Does that mean that we're in trouble? Does that mean we're not holding up our end of the bargain? Well, I don't think so. I think we're actually in good company. If we go back to verse 20, it says, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had promised to do what he had promised. Except the perceptive among you will realize that Abraham did waver about the promise of God because he interfered with God's plan by trying to start a family with Hagar, if you don't believe me, you can read all about it in Genesis chapter 16. The man that Paul sets up as the linchpin of his argument actually had a big wobble. I love that. The man held up as the model for faith actually had faith problems. How very human. It gives me and it gives us great hope that we don't even need to get our faith right all of the time. We're in very good company. I just want to pause for a moment. I just want to take a minute and give you yourself the opportunity just to forgive yourself. Just to forgive yourself. Both for times that you think, I can't believe I did that. And I can't believe what I've done over the last couple of months. But also for the times that you just feel like I don't even have the energy for faith. I just don't even have it in me to sit 
in God's presence at the moment. We all find ourselves in different places this morning, and that's okay. And I just want to give us a minute just to spend in the presence of God as we just consider. Amen. Audrey mentioned earlier that actually doing this series uh, actually sometimes raises more questions uh, than we've got answers for. So I have a side note and I have a question. I don't quite know how to answer, but the side note is this also opens up the very important questions of what does this say about how we read Scripture and how Old Testament and Scripture is interpreted by the New Testament writers and indeed by Jesus himself. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is for another day and not for right now. Looking back, Abraham was an incredible man of faith. He leaned into God his whole life. He responded to the voice of God. At 75, along with his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, he moved his whole household and possessions away from Haran, his community the seat of his ancestral home. He heard the voice of God and he moved his whole family, not knowing where he was going to go and where he was going to end up. You can read all about it in Genesis 12. So what does this covenant faithfulness look like? Well, this is Romans 2. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Interesting. In light of what God has done for us, we are called to do good. We are called to persist in doing good. If we do, we will receive glory, honor, and peace. If we don't, there will be trouble and distress. You see, God's offer of a covenant relationship is free. But if we choose it, it will require everything of us. God's offer of a covenant relationship is free. But if we choose it, it will require everything of us. Just like in a marriage, where the choice to get in is free, but the commitment when you choose is exclusive. It requires all of you. You can't choose to be married one day and not the next. You can't let anything, including children, take priority in that relationship. When you enter into a covenant relationship with God, it requires all of you. It's not a partial commitment. Being in a covenant relationship with God 
looks like a business person turning down that big job promotion to stay local in their community or to spend more time with their family. It looks like a pastor moving on from a church she served for a long time and setting aside her personal wants and desires to pursue what God has next rather than settling for a 10-year safe period before retirement. You will know what it looks like for you. But my challenge to you this morning is to both accept the free offer of a covenant relationship and also think through the obligation of that covenant relationship if you choose to enter into it. Let's just pray together, and then I'll invite Audrey back up. God, I thank you for the free offer of a covenant relationship with you today. I thank you that many people in this room have been in that covenant relationship for a long time. I thank you for the way that you've been changing and restoring us. I thank you that everybody in this room is equal standing before you. And God, for those that don't know you, I pray that they would seek someone out today to enter into that relationship with you. And for those of us who have been in that relationship for a while, God, help us to consider again what it is that you're calling us to and the commitment that it requires from us to flourish in the relationship with you. I just ask this in your name. Amen.